We'll take out our Bibles together and turn to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10 today. Before we get into the message, let's bow together for prayer. And uh, let's uh, all pray together that that God would use this time of opening up His Word uh, to speak to our hearts and to point us toward Jesus, and uh, that God would build us up by uh, His proclaimed Word today. Let's all pray. Oh, our Father, we rejoice that we can sing with joy in our hearts, Rock of Ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in Thee. Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to Thy cross I cling. I pray that that would be the, the cry of the depths of our heart today, as we open up God's Word, as we crave that the Spirit of God would, beyond the the words of of a man, that the Spirit of God would take hold of our hearts by God's Word and would speak to us to build us up, to build every Christian up in the things of the Lord, to draw those who are not yet saved to see Jesus and to know Him as Savior. I pray that we would know that as we've been here together, that God has done a powerful work in our hearts and there's been an eternal benefit to this time that we've been together in the house of God this day. Father, we crave Your work We beg for it, and we ask that you would do that powerful work among us today. I pray for gospel-proclaiming churches all around this community, and gospel-proclaiming churches throughout the world, that the gospel of Jesus Christ would have free course today, and that countless souls would be swept into the kingdom of heaven by the preaching of the gospel. We commit this to you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. We are in the midst of a very challenging, doctrinal, heavy, thick, doctrinal section of the book of Romans. And I hope that it has uh, been spiritually beneficial for you. Uh, Chapter 9 that we just finished, uh, that I just finished preaching through last Sunday is a difficult passage to preach through. It is, a, it is just chock full of verses that are tough to grapple with. They, they, they challenge our minds, they challenge our hearts, but it's, it's, uh, it's as, as God's Word says, it is profitable uh, for doctrine. And the, the doctrine, the heavy doctrines of Scripture, the doctrines of the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ, this is what our souls need. My great fear for churches, especially in this country, is that we have reduced the teaching of this blessed book to a bunch of moralisms, to a bunch of quaint little means and methods, 10 ways to do that, 10, uh, 12 ways to get this, and, and uh, you know, all these methods of, of how to get what God wants, or what, uh, what you want when you pray, uh, you know, 10 ways to be a better parent, 100 ways to be a better husband, right? Um, you know, these things, we, we do find these things in Scripture, but they all flow through the river of the gospel. And any mean, any method, any uh, principle of Scripture that you see as divorced from the gospel, you are not seeing it rightly. Men and women understand something. How can we be better spouses 
How can we be better parents? How can we be better employees? You know, just take the take the issue of parenthood. Some of you have little ones. Well, I say little ones some, and older ones at home. How can you be the best parent that you need to be for your children? You need to live out the reality of a sinner who has been saved by grace in Jesus Christ alone. And that is lived out in, in how you live your life. It is taught in every teaching of your children. But this is the most basic thing from which everything else flows. Men and women understand something. We, we get to heaven when we see in the book of Revelation a snapshot of eternity to come. It says that the saints are gathered around the throne of God. And what are we doing? We are rejoicing in worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive blessing and honor and glory and power and wisdom. And, uh, and that, is the, that is going to be the backbone of our rejoicing for all of eternity. So when believers gather together and when God's word is proclaimed, the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ and believers rejoicing in that gospel is a foretaste of heaven. And, and I hope that as uh, the, the book of Romans is dense, gospel truth that is repeated over and over and over and over again, I hope that your response is not, okay, uh, you know, here we go again. You know, all that the preacher ever talks about is the righteousness of Christ, the power of the blood, all those, you know, I hope that you're, I hope you're not wearied of that. If you are wearied of it, eternity is going to be a long time for you <laughs> because that's all we're going to do for all of eternity. And uh, the heart of the believer responds in joy in what Christ has done. And I hope that that is the, uh, the heartbeats uh, that it, it, with you today. Our day has exalted a person's feeling of accomplishment as the ultimate thing. More important even than if anything has really even been accomplished. I was just having a discussion with somebody the other day talking about um, relief efforts for those affected by hurricanes and saying, yeah, he, the, the person was telling me, I just read this uh, news report about all this stuff that is being taken down to North Carolina by the truckloads. And they're saying that probably 40% uh, of what is being taken down there is completely unusable. And that, you know, people donate stuff and they have good intentions but they don't donate. Many, many people don't actually donate usable stuff. Um, for many years, we did our best here to maintain a food pantry. And we would say, okay, you know, folks, as you have the opportunity to pick up a, a, a little bit extra at the grocery store, want to bring it to the food pantry, that is great. But... I cannot tell you how much stuff was donated to the food pantry that was completely unusable. I mean, nothing says we appreciate you, we, we want to, uh, we want to help you as giving somebody some deodorants. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that can be really taken in the wrong way. Um, and, you know, a lot of people that would call the food, you know, call and say, oh, I could use some help with food. A lot of times they're staying in a, in a motel and, you know, don't take them a cake mix. They can't cook stuff. They need something they can just open a can or warm something up. Uh, but some of the stuff is can be quite comical. Just people would bring in old expired food. Uh, people would bring in used stuff. Uh, you know, canned tuna, good. Canned clams, not so much. Not so much. 
But people feel like they have done something, where in reality, somebody, I don't, and believe, if you say, oh, I brought in canned clams, I don't know who brought in what, okay? But a lot of times, people are just going through their pantry, and, oh, I, you know, I can't bring myself to throw this away, I'll just give it to the church. Um, they just tasked someone else with disposing of their junk. We want to be engaged in that which is meaningful and worthwhile. And probably most of us, at some time in your employment history, you have felt like an employer uh, gave you busy work to do, right? Especially in your introductory days of getting into some, uh, into some profession or occupation, you felt like somebody just gave you busy work. And I remember when I was in high school and college working construction and, uh, all right, we'll send the kid out to pull nails out of boards and, okay. Uh, so uh, nobody likes busy work. It's insulting to the person who is subjected to it. There's no inherent value in mere work. There is no inherent value even in mere sacrifice. Even if the work and the sacrifice are costly, work and sacrifice have to be directed by truth in order to be worthwhile. You understand, understand where I'm going with that? Work and even sacrificial work and sacrificial giving have to be directed by truth. There is actually a need, and what I am doing is directed toward that need. And if work and sacrifice are not directed by truth, they're not worthwhile. Now, our text today obliterates the modern notion that so many people have today that God is in heaven begging for attention. God is in heaven and he will accept whatever scrap of attention that we give him as long as we are sincere. And this has been the lie of the devil from the beginning. From Genesis chapter 4, we see that the first siblings, Cain and Abel, they brought their offerings to the Lord. And Cain, did, he, he didn't refuse to make a sacrifice. He didn't say, no, I'm not giving anything. I refuse but instead, what did Cain do? Cain said, I will come to God in the way that makes sense to me. I'll come to God on, the, on my terms, my way. Abel, on the other hand, what did he do? Abel submitted himself to the direction of God, and Abel brought of the first of his flocks unto the Lord. The Bible tells us that Cain and his offering, he gave, Cain and his offering were rejected. Abel and his offering were accepted. Now we look around today and we see countless religious people who are devoted. Devoted. People who are very sincere in what they are doing. People that are diligent in what they are doing. Whether it be sacraments, whether it be sacrificial giving, whether it be selfless acts of service, You've got devout, diligent, sincere people that do not come in keeping with what this book proclaims. Understand something. People, you know, you probably most of you have had the experience of having somebody from a religious cult group knocking at your door. 
The Jehovah's Witnesses, understand, they are not coming to you with a message of the gospel. They don't come with the message of the gospel. I, when the Jehovah's Witnesses come to my door and they have their spiel about, you know, new heavens and new earth, they say, okay, uh, let's, let's, let's really, that's a real thing, but let's put that to the side. I want to talk about what really makes the difference between what you believe and what I believe. Let's talk about who Jesus is, okay? They don't come with the message of Jesus. They don't preach Jesus. Other false religious groups are not preaching Jesus Christ. Are they nice people? Maybe. Maybe. Are they sincere? Yes. Are they devoted? Yes. Hindus by the millions sacrificially make journeys to the Ganges River because they have been taught that they can wash their sins away in those waters. Muslims make their pilgrimages to Mecca and to Medina. And understand, they do so at great personal sacrifice. You likely know that I'm telling you that God does not and cannot accept people on the basis of their outward religious works. You know that to be true. You know that when the God's word is proclaimed here, that God's word is going to be proclaimed as it preaches that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, without any involvement of works whatsoever. You know that. And if you've been here for any amount of time, you know, you know the right answers to the questions. But truth be told, in the recesses of your heart, do you find yourself sometimes wondering, but maybe will he? Could God? Could it maybe be that these who truly reject Jesus reject what this word says about the coming of Jesus Christ, who He is and what He did, can it be that they can still be right with God nonetheless? We're going to look at God's word to see what God says about this. What God says about mere religious sincerity. Religious sincerity even though it's wrong. Religious devotion, religious works. What does the Bible say? Romans chapter 10, verse 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness have not submitted to the righteousness of God. Verse 4, I told you last week, if you underline in your Bible, this verse should be double underlined. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. For Moses writes about the righteousness which is of the law. The man who does these things shall live by them. But the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven. That is to bring Christ down from above. Or who will descend into the abyss. That is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. I would love to continue reading, but I'm only going to bite off as much as I'm going to be able to chew for today. We'll jump into verse 9 next Sunday. Paul says, 
They have a zeal for God. They have a zeal for God. And zeal has the idea of emotional ardor and tenacious, sincere activity. These people are, religiously speaking, they're diligent. They work hard. They're sincere. They're passionate. In fact, Jesus said of the Pharisees, Jesus said, you would, comp you would compass heaven and earth to make one proselyte. Compass heaven and earth to make one proselyte. Here we are taught that it is possible for a person to be those sincere yet sincerely wrong. Though sincere, to be sincerely wrong. Here are people who truly are not saved. People who are not right with God. Even though, in the words of our text, they have a zeal for God. Verse 2. It doesn't just say they have a zeal. It says they have a zeal for God. Here are, humanly speaking, good people, sincere people, loving people, diligent people. But all of these things, all of these descriptors about these people ultimately did mean nothing because that zeal is not blossoming from the knowledge of the gospel. The zeal is not coupled with the right knowledge. Just like you can be engaged in all kinds of activity, but if it's not directed by truth, it's meaningless. Zeal itself, if it doesn't spring from truth, is meaningless. They have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. Nothing can take the place of God's gracious gift of salvation for those who come to him in repentance and in faith in the person and the work of Jesus Christ alone. Nothing can take that place. Right? You know that, right? If people can be right with God by any religion, as long as they are good and sincere... As long as they are diligent, as long as they are sacrificial, men and women, Jesus Christ did not have to come. Right? If people can be right with God, if people can be saved, if people can be forgiven, as long as they are sincere, as long as they are diligent, as long as they are faithful, then salvation is by works. It is not by grace. What does it say about these people? It says they served the law, but they didn't truly understand the law. They served the law, but they did not understand the law. They knew the facts about the law, but they didn't have a clear grasp and perception of what this law was all about. Verse 3 uh, says that they did not submit to the righteousness of God. So what's that describe? It describes a it describes pride, self-righteousness. I can do it. I can be good enough. I can be I can I can achieve the mark. Self-satisfaction, content with their own level of spiritual ex uh, experience. The righteousness of God, if you know Christ as your Savior, the time came in your life, there was a point in time when you submitted yourself to the righteousness of God. What does that mean? You came to the place of recognizing that there is a righteousness that God requires that you cannot achieve. Cannot. God requires it. I can't achieve it. I can't render it. I need a righteousness that doesn't come from within, but a righteousness that comes from without. That is what Jesus has given. 
The gospel obliterates any notion of self-satisfaction. The gospel brings us to the end of ourselves. And to be brought to the end of yourself is to be brought to the beginning of Christ. Let me repeat that. To be brought to the end of yourself is to be brought to the beginning of Christ. This humbles us. That's why we have to submit to it. This is why the, the prior passage at the end of chapter 9 talked about these people that to them Jesus was a stumbling stone. They're stumbling over Jesus into hell because they will not submit to the righteousness of God. There's a false Christianity that is infested and plagued our churches. And that's the false Christianity of the easy believism of our day that says that having a religious experience that has no effect upon your uh, life whatsoever equals eternally secure salvation. What does the gospel do? The gospel casts us upon Christ for salvation. We submit ourselves. We recognize if we are going to be saved, it's not going to come from within. It comes from without. We humble ourselves. We present ourselves unto God as a people who have nothing to offer. I don't come before God saying, God, look at all these good things about me. God, look at all my talents. Look at all my abilities. God, I'm pretty smart. God, I'm better than my neighbor. God, I'm better than you know, this person or that person. God, there's a lot of great things about me that make me acceptable to you. No. If you know Christ is your Savior, you have come to God. In the words of the song we sang earlier, nothing in my hands I bring simply to thy cross I cling. I've got no righteousness that is acceptable to God. Romans 8, 28 says that God has predestined believers to be conformed to the image of Jesus. Day by day, we are becoming less and less like self and more and more like Christ. That is pro God's progressive work of sanctification. All right, sanctification. God, is, God has saved me and God is working in me to make me daily more like Jesus. That is what salvation is. God has saved you. You've come to the end of yourself. You realize you're a sinner who needs a Savior. Jesus died on the cross for you. God doesn't save you and then just say, okay, you're done. Now it's up to you to work it out from here. If that were the case, we'd all be a mess. No, God saves you. He has predestined you to be conformed to the image of His Son. He is daily working in your life to do what? To shape you, to chisel you, to... God takes out the sandpaper and He sands away those rough edges. And some of you say, some, for some of you, your sandpaper is your co-worker or your boss, maybe your pastor. And that sandpaper is just grating you and it's scraping you and it's chafing you one stroke after another, after another, after another. And you say, I can't handle this anymore. And you know what God's saying in heaven? I'm doing this to make you more like Jesus. I was just having to deal with an issue for myself. Uh, de dealing with this for weeks that somebody, somebody trying to steal my identity. Oh my goodness, I'm the last person you want to be, trust me. I'm the last person you want to be. <laughs> oh yeah, uh, weeks and weeks of having to deal with this mess. And I had to come to places that God has a purpose in this. Thank God it's settled, settled. Um, thank God. God has a purpose in this. Christ likeness, making me more like Jesus. How is this? I don't know. I don't know. It's frustrating, irritating, spend hours of my life on the phone with people who really are not interested in helping me. Transfer me to, and talk about busy work. Oh yeah, you need to talk to this department. Then they transfer me to the other department. Then transfer me back to where I've already been. It's about an hour and a half, two hours. You've got to be kidding me. I said, okay, God has a purpose. God is making me more like Jesus. How, how is he? I don't know. But I submit myself to this sandpaper, to this work that God is doing, because I am a, I'm, a, I'm a terribly flawed 
person who needs God's intervening work of making me like Jesus. And he doesn't do it with a feather duster, does he? God does it through hard experiences. Verse 4. This is a precious verse. Let me read for you verse 4 in the word order of the original language. In the original language, the word order is this. For the end of the law is Christ for righteousness to everyone who believes. For the end of the law is Christ for righteousness to everyone who believes. The end is the, is the goal, not the cessation, but the goal. The goal of the law is Christ for righteousness for everyone who believes. The goal of the law has never been, nor will it ever be, saving us by our efforts. That has never been the goal of the law. Meriting salvation has never been the path. Oh, the people in the Old Testament making sacrifices and, and observing feasts and rituals and festivals, they weren't saved by making a sacrifice. They were saved by looking through this ritual to Christ, the Messiah, who was coming. They looked to Jesus by faith yet to come. We look to Jesus by faith as he has already come. Okay? The end of the law, the goal of the law, whether Old Testament, New Testament, Christ for righteousness. Galatians chapter 3 says that the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Literally, and the schoolmaster in the Roman culture was a, uh, was a person who was hired in a wealthy family as a private tutor for the boys of the family. And his job was to make these boys into men. And that person was often absolutely brutal. So Roman boys would often be literally beaten up by their schoolmaster. Okay, So when Paul uses that term, for them, that was a very vivid term. The law pummels us to Jesus. The law shows us that we cannot conform to God's holy demands in ourselves so that we get to that place of saying, nothing in my hands I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. Hebrews chapter 10 says that sacrifices were never able to take away sins. Law-keeping has never been set forward as a way of salvation Salvation always has been. Salvation always will be by grace through faith in Christ alone with absolutely no involvement of human works whatsoever. The goal of the law, the end of the law, what is it? Christ for righteousness. The law teaches me I don't produce a righteousness acceptable to God. I've got to get to Christ for righteousness. We brought to the end of ourselves so that we flee to Christ and we receive the righteousness that he has earned in life and that he has paid for and by his own shed blood. So here were people, sincere as they were, they served the law, but they were ignorant of the true meaning of the law. They also learned about a Messiah, but they completely missed him. The Jewish culture was all about the coming Messiah. But yet, when John the Baptist preached, what did John say? There stands one among you whom you know not. He's right here and you are blind to him. So Paul was dealing with the people that knew all about the Messiah. Verses 5 through 8 teach us that, a, that, uh, that for a person to seek to gain favor by, uh, with God by their own merits, they completely deny what Jesus came to do. 
Paul here quotes from Deuteronomy chapter 30 in order to teach them that to try to earn salvation is to completely miss the point of the entire Old Testament. He says, if you say in your heart, so these are challenging verses here from verses 5 through 8. He says, um, do not say in your heart who will ascend to heaven. That is to bring Christ down from above. What does that mean? What that means is if you say in your heart and saying in your heart has the implication of something that you would say inwardly that you would never say outwardly. Okay, that you know isn't right, but you still harbor it inside. If you say in your heart that you will claw and scratch to gain your way to heaven, Paul is saying, why would you think that way? It's to say in your heart, Jesus, you didn't do enough. You didn't do enough. True, you came, you lived a perfect, sinless life. You died on the cross for sins. That wasn't enough. You need me to be good enough. You say in your heart, who shall ascend into heaven? That brings Christ down from above. Jesus, you didn't do enough. You need to come back down and finish what you started. Then he says, who would descend into the abyss that is to bring Christ up from the dead? What does he mean by that? Do you think you can descend down into the abyss of the depths of hell and death and take away the powers uh, and take on the powers of darkness? Do you think you yourself can defeat sin and Satan by your own power? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. And the idea is to object that his death and resurrection is not enough. Jesus, you need to do more. So whether unbelief takes the, faith, uh, the face of the atheism, this is, oh, I don't believe that God exists, or those who think that they can be good enough to earn salvation, unbelief always stands in opposition to what this book teaches us about the person and work of Jesus Christ. If you are not saved, if you are not right with God, if your sins are not forgiven, if you have an unbiblical view about how you can be right with God, ultimately, your problem is a problem with Jesus. Okay? Your problem is a problem with Jesus. Who he is, what he came, what is the purpose of his coming, what is the power of his coming? His all sufficiency. The ultimate question is can I really trust that he is mighty to save? When Hebrews tells us that he saves to the uttermost all that come unto God by him, do I really trust that? Or do I say, Yes, I trust Jesus 75%, but I still think i got to be good enough. No. You're stumbling over Jesus. Verse 8 says that God has brought his word near to you, the word of faith that's proclaimed in the gospel. It's brought near to you. The message of salvation is, is not a high intellectual message that only the brilliant can attain intellectually to. In fact, Paul, in another place, he says, look around, not many mighty are called. God chooses, God calls the simple people. The gospel is not something that only an intellectual giant can understand. It's not a difficult message that takes you years of labor to dig down and to crack the code on how to get to God. The message of the gospel is plain. The message of the gospel is accessible. It is understandable. The gospel is amazing both in its depth and in its simplicity, the same message of the gospel, not the same exact words, 
but the same core message of the gospel that is being preached in this room is being taught to the young ones downstairs. Same message. Same message. What did Jesus say? Don't hold the children back. Encourage them to come to me. Of such is the kingdom of heaven. It's we older people that get so that we get all bogged down in the complication of life experience. The little ones, they hear about Jesus being their Savior. Great! I know I need a Savior. I'll trust Him. Jesus loves me. This I know for the Bible tells me so. That is a powerful gospel message. Been a lot of parents saved because they sent their children to Sunday school and the children came and back came back singing Jesus loves me. The trouble is that we can't understand how to it, it, the trouble isn't that we can't understand how to attain to it. The trouble that we have is we refuse to submit to the righteousness of God. Has the law of God brought you to the place of seeing your need of Jesus today? Has the law of God brought you to the place of seeing your need of Jesus? Men and women, if one soul enters heaven by a righteousness that they achieved, by their own religious deeds, their own religious sacrifice, their own zealous sincerity. If one soul enters heaven by their own works, the coming of Jesus was a complete waste. It wasn't necessary because we could have done it ourselves. There are many, many sincere people, but people who are sincerely wrong and headed out to a Christless eternity. One of golf's immortal moments came from a man in Scotland who came to introduce the game of golf to President Ulysses S. Grant. So he's on the lawn of the White House, placed the ball on the tee, reared back, took a mighty swing, and I know none of us can really imagine such a thing happening, but the club hit the turf and scattered the dirt all over the president and the surrounding vicinity, and when you look down, the ball is still sitting exactly where it was before. I have no concept of this kind of thing ever happening. I've heard of other people having that trouble. So the man places the ball back on the tee, takes his club back and rears it again and takes another swing. Same thing happens. It happens five times. Five times. Finally, President Grant stopped the man, quietly said to him, there seems to be a fair amount of exercise involved in this game. I fail to see the purpose of the ball. <laughs> Men and women, there are a lot of people, spiritually, religiously speaking, there's a lot of exercise. There's a lot of, there's a torrent of activity, but they're not making one stride forward to have peace with God. Is that the case with you? The end of the law, Christ for righteousness. That's what you need. Let's bow together for prayer. Oh, Father, we desire to be diligent we desire to be sincere, but yet I pray that you would work in the heart of each person here. I pray that we would be, that our, that our labor would be directed by truth. I pray that we would have a zeal for God, a zeal that is according to knowledge and not without knowledge. 
pray, Father, that for every person here, they would submit themselves to the righteousness of God. They would come to Jesus and be saved. We thank you for Christ. We thank you for the gospel. We thank you for its proclamation. The word that is near to us, this word of faith. Believe, in, uh, th- th- confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. Believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead and you'll be saved. And, oh, Father, I pray that if there be one here, that today is without Christ, they would get to him. And as the words of this message make their way out online, I pray that you would use what has been said, not only in this room, but in days to come to draw sinners savingly to Jesus. We pray in his precious and holy name. Amen.